Okay, welcome back for lecture three on chapter 21, nucleic acids and protein synthesis. We ended sort of abruptly last time. There was no learning check. Uh, we just sort of stopped when we had covered the primary structure, and they were very similar for DNA and RNA. We read the same sort of way, uh, just the DNA has the deoxyribose versus the RNA having the ribose. And then, of course, with base pairs, DNA has thymine and RNA has uracil. Otherwise, uh, things were very similar and short and sweet, and hopefully you enjoyed the last lecture. And this one's also quite sweet, although uh, we will be more traditional with a learning check at the end of this lecture. Our particular focus here for this relatively brief lecture is a very important concept, the DNA double helix. So um, Watson and Crick's uh, baby, so to speak, unfortunately something that certainly our good friend Linus Pauling, who decoded all of that protein, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure stuff from previous lectures, uh, would likely have discovered if uh, he were permitted to go and see the same micrographs, the uh, x-ray crystallographs, I should say, that Watson and Crick got to see. So uh, we'll keep the controversy out of things for now, but let's discuss the DNA double helix. Okay, let's talk about some uh, understanding of DNA. First of all, the percentage of bases in DNA, uh, according to Shargaff's rules for DNA of various organisms, the percentage of adenine, A, is the same as the percentage of thymine, T, and the percentage of guanine, C, is the same as the percentage of cytosine, C, uh, although they're not the same as each other, right? So if we look at uh, the human organism, for instance, uh, probably the one we're most interested in here in this course, since I know a number of you are uh, nursing bound or other health professions to deal with human physiology, we see there that humans are about 30% adenine, 30% thymine, 20% guanine, and 20% cytosine in our DNA. So we sum to 100% total, that's good, uh, but we're slightly richer in adenine and thymine and slightly not as rich in guanine and cytosine. If we compare ourselves to the chicken, uh, well, they're a little richer in those C's and G's uh, and a little poorer than us in A's and T's. Uh, salmon are roughly the same as chickens uh, in terms of their percentages of bases in DNA. Of course, they're quite different. Uh, I may not be a biologist, but I do know they are different organisms. And then finally, as we go down, uh, corn and neurospora are uh, even more uh, G and C rich and even less uh, A and T percentage wise. So there you have it, some select organisms. Uh, as we'll see, those C G bonds are actually more difficult to break. So it's better for us as humans that we don't have so many because uh, it allows for uh, our DNA to unravel slightly more easily than the other organisms on this slide. All right, so regardless of which organism we were discussing in that previous table, uh, they always had the same AT and same CG percentages, uh, and that has to do with the complementary base pairing that we have in DNA. So DNA contains complementary base pairs in which adenine is always linked by two hydrogen bonds to thymine. So there we see the AT uh, base pairing, hydrogen bonding, not a true chemical bond. That's important. If it was a covalent bond, uh, this would be very tough to unravel and we'd have a tough time replicating cells and that's a problem. So it's nice and stable when it needs to be, but it's not so stable that it can't break when it needs to break. So really elegant chemistry. Uh, nature does a beautiful job uh, of uh, the, just the best chemistry out there. So there we see the adenine and the thymine, um, and uh, we see that, uh, of course, uh, these are just the base pair parts, the rest of the nucleotides not shown for simplicity, uh, but you can see they're perfectly poised for those two hydrogen bonds, where the adenine, uh, the higher amine group there, uh, the NH2 group, uh, one of its H's bonds to a lone pair uh, in a, um, uh, a carbonyl of a thymine molecule, and then uh, the uh, nitrogen below in the ring, uh, now it's the hydrogen bond acceptor, uh, its lone pair accepts a hydrogen bond from the nitrogen-hydrogen uh, bond of thymine. So there we have it, really neat, really elegant chemistry. I mentioned a few slides ago that uh, the CG bond is slightly harder to break, and that's because the uh, cytosine and guanine are linked by three hydrogen bonds to the adenine-thymine two hydrogen bonds. So it is a more difficult 
uh, bond to break. Now, of course, it's not true chemical bonds. It's hydrogen bonding, uh, but you have three uh, hydrogen bonds versus two hydrogen bonds. So it does require a greater input of energy here. So we see the, the guanine and the cytosine, uh, and it, same sort of deal this time, the um, guanine carbonyl up top is a hydrogen bond acceptor for the uh, NH2 amine from the cytosine, and then the lower nitrogens on the guanine, uh, their uh, NH bond is a hydrogen bond donor to the uh, ring nitrogen lone pair and then the oxygen lone pair in that ring carbonyl. So there we have it, uh, three hydrogen bonds for CG versus only two for AT. And of course, if the subject of our lecture here is the double helix of DNA. Uh, we get that double helix structure by having two strands of nucleosides that form a double helix structure like a spiral staircase. So we have the one strand and then it's complement those uh, on the one strand. If we have A, it'll bond to a T on the next strand. If we have a G on one strand, it bonds to the C on the next strand by hydrogen bonding. And so those bases complement one another all the way along. And that's why uh, in the human organism, uh, we're about 30% uh, A's and 30% T's, uh, and then about 20% G's and 20% C's, uh, because uh, wherever we have an A on one strand, we have a T on its complement. So we can't have anything but uh, an equal amount of A and T. And likewise, we can't have anything but an equal amount of C and G. But of course, we don't have to have equal amounts of A, T, and equal amounts of CG. We're um, richer in the AT linkages, whereas other organisms are richer in the CG linkages. All right, so before we end this lecture, let's go ahead and have a learning check to make sure we're getting that concept across. So in this learning check, you're asked to write the complementary base sequence for the matching strand in the DNA section shown below. So we have at the five prime free phosphate end, uh, a, G, T, C, C, A, A, T, C, and then that's the free uh, OH uh, and the three prime hydroxy group on the ring carbon. So there you have it. Go ahead and give the complement. Uh, stop the video here if you need a little time to do that. Start us back up when you're ready to check your work. Good luck. Okay, now one of the subtleties you might not have caught is that if we start the five prime end on our one strand, then it's going to be the three prime end on the complement. So we have three prime, and then the A links to the T, the G links to a C, the T links to an A, the G to a, a C rather to a G, C to a G, A to a T, A to a T, T to an A. C to a G, and then now we're at the five prime end of the complement. So uh, there, uh, we are starting five prime to three prime on the one strand. So we're going to be uh, reverse three prime to five prime on the complementary strand. So hopefully that's what you arrived at. If the three prime and three prime and five prime uh, was the only thing that caught you up, then hopefully uh, that's clear now. Uh, if you really didn't know what to expect or how we arrived at this, then please do reach out to me before moving on. Otherwise, I will see you in the next lecture on chapter 21.